first of all, thank you so much for letting us watch that incredible documentary. Um, we were one. Uh, my first question, considering it's such an, uh, it, this has such an impact on the Japanese community. Has the mentality changed a lot since you, since Fukushima and after? Uh, thank you very much for coming to the film and for staying for the Q and A. Um, if it's okay, I'm going to do the Q and A in English. <laughs> Come on. Okay. Um, has the mentality changed? Um, I think it has changed. I think in the beginning, um, like a lot of the world, um, people were very concerned about what's happening, and it was in the news uh, to some degree in Japan, and people talked about it. Um, but as the young girl who's 17 that, that speaks at the end of the film, one of the biggest problems is that people are start, starting to forget. And so unfortunately, uh, the mentality has changed, but not, not in a good way, I don't think. And even people in Tokyo maybe aren't thinking about it so much, and they kind of, I think you, you see, it's human nature, you can't sort of remain at that level of panic. You would become sick just from the panic. But unfortunately, the result is, is that um, people move on, and uh, these, these women that you see in the film are not, in, are not the majority. This is a story that I think is not being told. And, and uh, this is why I wanted to, to film with them, because they're really fighting against um, the society. In Japan, the, uh, in Japanese, there's an expression which is um, the nail that sticks up, that gets hammered down. And so they are very much fighting against um, the, the mainstream way of thinking. In terms of the authorities, um, especially right after the, the disaster, TEPCO and the Japanese authorities have definitely, uh, the, the in, in new stream was said to be quite controlled as well. In terms of making the documentary, what did you experience during that? Um, this is actually the second feature documentary that I've made uh, in Fukushima. The first one was filmed one month after the nuclear meltdown, and we actually filmed it in, inside the evacuation zone. And at that time, I mean, people were evacuating, they weren't coming in. And so although I don't have press credentials, I'm not a journalist, um, nobody stopped me, nobody asked me what I was doing because I think they assumed you know, that anybody who was there belonged there. And even with this film, I got very little resistance outside of um, the medical advisor that you see at the beginning and the vice principal. Um, so surprisingly, um, I haven't really met so much outward resistance, although there's been resistance maybe in, in kind of other ways. Uh, such as? Um, such as in ways that I don't have any proof, but I can tell you that I'm, there are things that are happening in my life which are the timing, if it's a coincidence, are just really impeccable. And, and this is a story that I, that, that I share with other journalists. Um, I belong to the, I, although I'm not a journalist, I belong to the press club in, in, in Japan. And we talk about these things, and we worry for people that live in Japan. I've lived, lived in Japan for a long time, and that's where my home is. Um, you worry about your ability to, to remain in your home. So it's very different than somebody who goes in to film a story. Um, for example, um, uh, the people that made the cove about um, the dolphin issues in Japan, many of them were people that were coming into Japan specifically to make that film. And so if they, if they became banned from entering the country, it wouldn't be so devastating, they, as long as they got the shots that they needed. And, but for those of us who live there, if we were to be banned from living there, if our visas were taken away, then that would be devastating. And so we, we talk about this idea of self-censorship. So how far do we go? Because everything I have is not in the film. There's more. But you hold back to some degree. And it isn't something that I'd like to admit, but um, we all hold back. We all self-censor to some degree. And even the, the mothers in the film, who maybe they want to take part in anti-nuclear demonstrations, but they actually are afraid of showing their face, of being filmed, of being put on television. And so they don't participate in, in a way that they would like to. And even just appearing in this film, these women have uh, taken a huge risk of, be, of becoming alienated from their society just by appearing in this film. And all they asked in return was to please bring their story out into the world. And so that's what I've tried to do. And so that's why it's such a huge honor to be here at, at, at this festival and at the other festivals that are screening the film, because this is the only way to, to, to bring their story out into the world. And so I'm just really grateful um, to, to be here. And they asked me to, to tell the people um, that came 
to say thank you for, for listening to their story and for caring about what's happening. And um, one of the things that I've been doing uh, going around to different film festivals is um, if people are, feel moved to give a message, if they want to say something um, to the mothers, I've been recording um, those messages of support and putting Japanese subtitles on them and sharing it with the mothers. So I'm going to be in the lobby uh, after this, and if anybody feels called to uh, give a message of support to the mothers, I would be honored uh, to film that. In terms of difficulties during the filming process, were there any major, major hurdles that you needed, needed to take, especially concerning radiation in this case? Yeah, I mean, I suppose if I, if you really, if I really thought about people asking this question about me or about, you know, I, I don't really think it's not something that I really think about. Um, I don't, I, for example, I don't measure radiation. So if somebody who I'm filming with is measuring radiation, then we measure it. But otherwise, you know, I don't, I don't walk around measuring it. Um, we do decontaminate the equipment and our clothing after we come back um, in the car. Um, and probably, no, definitely, if I had children in, in my home, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do this. I would bring that equipment and things back into a house so there were children. But there are children living in this area. And so as long as there are children there, somebody has got to go and document what's happening. So I'm going to go. Um, And are there any other questions from the audience for our director? The woman in the green right here. Um, I'm half Japanese, but I grew up in Europe, and I've been to Japan in April, since, um, the first time since um, 3.11, and I felt like the whole atmosphere has changed, and there is some feeling of you cannot say everything, and there are things you shouldn't mention, and if you mention them, everybody will be Sure. So maybe not everybody heard the question, so I'll repeat it. So basically, about it's a, it's about the uh, feeling how Japan is the general atmosphere in Japan now, and specifically regarding this new law, uh, new law that was passed regarding the exchange of information. Um, for anybody who's familiar with um, the American law of, um, I think it's the Patriot Act. Patriot Act but it's a, it basically uh, is a law that that is. Um, essentially being used to control uh, the information that, that journalists are, are sharing. And it's, but it's being used in a very kind of, um, with a very wide definition. And so they're actually using it to take down people's blogs and um, really using it to, to control this flow of information. Um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, and this law was just, was just passed in July. Um, it's, it's um, I don't know what to say. It's, uh, Unbelievable, and, and and people that watch the film have. Some people have said to me, you know, this would never happen in America. Well, you know what? It does happen in America, and uh, I just watched a film called um, uh, Project Chariot, which is about how uh, the fallout from nuclear testing in Nevada has been affecting uh, First Nation people. Um, it's an amazing film, uh, and it you know there are films that are made about. Uh, the radioactive testing in Marshall Islands. These are both things that have been done in America or by America. And so every major nuclear power that does nuclear testing, for example, does it in a place um, where the people don't look like them. You know, Russia did it in Kazakhstan. America did it, uh, does it in the desert. It affects First Nation people. Um, France did it uh, in French Polynesia. So. As long as you're, it's, it's almost like as long as you're, you're doing these things that affect people that don't look like you, that they speak a different language, they have a different skin color, you know, somehow it's okay. And even in Fukushima, these nuclear power plants that were 220 kilometers outside of America, oh, sorry, outside of Tokyo, all the power was being used in Tokyo, was being sent to Tokyo. And this area of Fukushima is an agricultural area. Most people are uh, agricultural, uh, they're farmers, they're poor, they speak with an accent. They're not from Tokyo, you know. They're a small population, and so it's like every, 
you know, I don't know what it is about human nature that does these things to, to, to um, groups of people, you know, that, that are not like them, but it's very sad. Another question? It's the man in the blue right here. Hi, and uh, thank you very much for uh, the, the film. Um, do you think the reaction of the authorities, be specifically Japanese, or I think you just touched upon it now, any sort of executive in any country responds that way? You know, it's funny, I was watching a news report that was, that was uh, shown on Japanese television. It was about Chernobyl. It was, it was uh, on the news like 15 years after Chernobyl, and it was about children with uh, thyroid cancer. And the newscaster said to the, to, the, to the Japanese photojournalist who was documenting the situation, how can this be happening? Isn't there even uh, a Japanese member of the World Health Organization? How can this be happening? And, uh, you know, there was such outrage at that. And now the same thing happens in Japan. And, it's like the same thing. So yeah, I think this is this is what every author, authority would do. And if you think about, well, why don't they just evacuate the children? Well, every kilometer that they evacuate represents people that have to offer compensation. And so I, I believe that, you know, I mean, we could get into a policy debate, you know, about how they made those evacuation zones and how, as they discovered, uh, the contamination went much further than what they were admitting to. They, they gradually increased the evacuation zone, which meant that people, children had already been exposed to the radiation by the time they were evacuated. And what I believe should happen is you should evacuate more people than necessary and then allow them to return as you figure out that it's safe. But it was the exact opposite. I mean, wouldn't it, be, wouldn't it be a wonderful regret to say, well, you know, we spent too much money, spent too much time to evacuate more people than we needed to, than it would be, say, in 10 years to say, gee, I wish we had done more, which is what's happening. So no, I think, I think this absolutely happens. And I also think that this film, uh, is, it is about Fukushima, of course, but it's also about any kind of group of, uh, oh, I just said it, but it's about any group of people that becomes marginalized. An example, somebody was talking about um, Hurricane Katrina and, and the similarities. And basically, if you had money, in Fukushima, this is true, and also uh, in America after Hurricane Katrina, if you, you would just leave. People, people left on their own. They didn't wait to be evacuated. So in Fukushima, anybody that had money and wanted to evacuate did. That includes the politicians' children and wives. But, but in, if you look at Hurricane Katrina, for example, the majority of people who died were people that either were economically disadvantaged or were ill and infirmed and in a hospital and couldn't be evacuated in time. And this is true in, in, in Fukushima. The majority of people who didn't get evacuated didn't have the money to. Any other questions? Yes, the man in the middle. Hi, yeah. I, I don't want to go into a, a technical debate, but it seemed to me very clear that people were relying solely on radiation meters rather than on uh, uh, detecting radiation, particularly um, alpha radiation, it seemed that there was no discussion at all um, about the difference between those two. And I, I, I tie this into the um, fact that, um, well, it's, it's, it seems to me to be an enormous cover-up and that's, that's, that's a confidence trick that's being played. Yeah, I mean, this idea, I mean, I, I will say, because um, you, you didn't mention this, and if, you, you, you probably know much more about radiation than I do, um, there are even some mistakes in, in, in what people believe. There are, there are people that believe things are incorrect even. Um, and that, to me, is part of the story. So what is it that these mothers know? What is it that they're being told? And, and how do they understand it? Because even if what they understand is wrong, it's still part of the story. But yes, I think um, your, um, your point is, is exactly correct. I mean, the, the way that they're measuring radiation, I mean, even the way they're measuring radiation isn't necessarily the correct way to do it, but that's, but they're, but they're, with no other information, that's what they're left to do, to do it by themselves. Um, and in some cases, it means that they have a false sense of security. For example, the glass badge that, that the children are wearing, it's, a, it's, a, it's the total radiation exposure for a three-month period, which, which doesn't really tell you anything. I mean, the kids could run into a radioactive hotspot and, and, and get that, that dose in one, in one hour, which is very different than getting a little, you know, being exposed to a very little bit of radiation over a three-month period, a little bit every day. But, that, but so that, having that radiation glass badge monitor gives you, a, like you said, a, a false sense of security. Or only measuring for radioactive cesium. Well, there's plutonium and there's other radioactive elements that are far more dangerous. And yet the government will say, well, there, there, you know, there's relatively small amounts of plutonium. Well, sure, there, there are relatively small amounts of plutonium, but there's still some there. Do you want to be eating it? 
which is, which is what, what's going to happen. So um, yeah, this, this is a, um, a, a very important point that you bring up. The woman in the black there. Shut up. Oh, hi, hi, Ian. Hi. Thank you so much for your film. It was illuminating and terrifying and sad. And uh, I, my question is, you know, I, I, I grew to know the mothers in it, and I love what you're doing, sending them messages. I think it's a wonderful thing to do. Uh, first question is, are you, are you intending to do something with that, uh, either broadcast that on your website, the messages publicly that people can have access to, to further spread the word and kind of make it a global message because I think that's something that, that could be done and should be done. Not to tell you what to do, you clearly know what you're doing. Um, but, and the second thing, I, which is, it's, it's a question relating to the film uh, uh, directly, with, uh, the man that was there who came on a few times in a suit, I missed at the beginning who he was, but he seemed to be the only person of uh, kind of an authority figure who spoke against what was happening and, and was was very upset that people weren't being more uh, forthcoming with this information internationally. Who was he to you? Okay, so the first question about the messages. Yes, I am. Uh, there is. I'm, I'm doing them as I as I can group them together. And so there's um, the world premiere uh, in June was in Germany, and I filmed a group of messages um, that I sent uh, that I gave to the mothers, and they really they wanted to share. I, it was for me. It was kind of personal for them, and I didn't know what to do. But they said, "You've got to put this on the internet," and so it's actually on my website, and it's called "From From Frankfurt to Fukushima," and it's all the messages from people at a screening just like this. And one of the girls who was there, um, a, a young woman, was uh, a, a, a small child uh, from Chernobyl, and she gave a message as a child of Chernobyl to these women. And I just came yesterday. I just came from Guam. Uh, we were at the Guam International Film Festival, and there was a woman from the Bikini Islands, and they also have their own 70-year history of uh, being exposed to uh, radiation from, from nuclear testing, and she gave a message to these women. Um, so yes, I think it's very important to do that. So I will, um, when I get back to Japan, I will edit these together, and um, with your permission, uh, share it uh, on the internet. Um, the second question is about um, the man in the suit. I, I intentionally um, don't identify people unless they say it within the film, so I, I'm sorry that it was confusing. Um, he uh, is an assemblyman, a local assemblyman uh, from this small city. Um, and he um, has studied as he can to try to understand what he can do to help his constituents. And he too faces this, sense, this idea of self-censorship because he faces uh, not being reelected because of appearing in this film. And he doesn't care about being a politician, but what he cares about is if he's not a politician, he's not gonna be able to help people. So how far does he go? Because he wants to get reelected to help them. It's a whole other level of uh, censorship and yeah. communist activity. Yeah, it really is. It's crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. The girl in the middle. Yes. And then I think people, non-Japanese men, don't understand how important it is to be able to belong to that club. Right. In terms of, uh, I mean, Access. the journalists. Mm -hmm. And also, the, um, uh, that's why the 26-year-old um, um, man saying that if this news is the broadcast it all over Japan, Japan, that's going to create a confusion. Right. That, that's, I think, that speaks in quite well. So if you could explain. Sure, I mean, there's a press club system in Japan, and if you're not a member of the press club, then you can't go to official press conferences. And so that, that is the way that the government controls the information. And if you do something that is, that is beyond what the government wants you to do, they'll take away your press credentials, and you'll no longer be able to go to press conferences. So that's why when you read any newspaper you read, generally speaking, it's all the same data, because the journalists are only writing what it is that they have. And just to clarify, I'm not a, I'm not a member of the Kisha system of the, of the Japanese press club, it's the foreign press club system. It's the Foreign Correspondence Club of Japan. So I actually don't have access to the official um, press conferences. But I have, but interestingly, what it does though is, is, that, is that people, the politicians that have information that they want to release and they can't do it within the official press club system go to the Foreign Correspondence Club of Japan and give that information. So that's, that's where, you know, where, I, uh, where I come in. Uh, or that's where my membership is. Interestingly, just to kind of go on from that, I held um, a preview screening of this film 
uh, in May, before the world premiere, and 88 people came to this press screen in the press club, 44 of them were journalists, and not one sentence was written about the film. And then, I, and, right? And then, uh, so I, I talked to one of them who was my friend, and I said, you know, I'm kind of hoping you can write a story. And he said, yeah, well, I talked to my editor about it, but he wouldn't let me write it. And I said, well, can you share with me why? And he said, well, because there's no hook. I mean, it isn't like the film has won any awards or anything, <laughs> right? And so then I went to, uh, to Germany, uh, to the world premiere, and um, uh, just to kind of give you a little bit of background, the film couldn't be shown in Japan. Nobody would watch it, nobody would, would allow it to be screened in Japan. I couldn't get anybody, uh, any cinemas or any distributors to, to watch it. And so my idea was um, to kind of do what's called reverse importing. So basically, um, my hope was to, to bring the film abroad, to get some, any kind of recognition. And that wasn't for me, but that was because I wanted to be able to bring the film back to Japan. So it's basically like if you're trying to sell uh, face cream in America, you tell them that it's popular in France. So I was trying to get it recognized by a foreign audience. So at the world premiere, the, the film wins the grand prize. So then, only then, did I get uh, some Japanese distributors that were interested in bringing the film back to Japan. So anyway, so I called my friend and I said, hey, the film just won this prize in Germany. And he said, yeah, but um, it's not like the film's going to be shown in Japan or anything, so there's really no, no connection for our readers. So it's just, you know, and this is coming from a journalist. So this is, this is what we're fighting against. Hi, Ian. Um, thank you so much for putting this documentary together. It's absolutely fantastic. And um, the fact that you've given permission for those individuals to find their courage to speak out is, is, is massive and hugely empowering. And I would imagine would be the ignition to perhaps shift cultural change ultimately. Um, one very important question for me is how could we in the audience help you um, to carry this message forward? Is there anything that we can do to support this? Um, are there any groups that we can arrange? Is there any continuation of, of your message that we can carry forward? Um, so what, what can we do? And, and this, this question, you know, uh, this is a great question, you know, basically, well, what did I want to accomplish from it by making this film? Was it also something that people asked me? You know, I don't, I don't know. And at the end of the film, you know, there's no resolution. And, and somebody actually criticized the film and said, there's no resolution. Well, yeah, well, there isn't any resolution, that's why. Um, but for me, the, see, the government is trying to fix the problem by doing these programs of decontamination without fully disclosing the truth about what, what's happening. How can you try to fix a problem if you don't even know what the problem is? That's like going to the doctor and getting an operation for an illness that you don't know what it is. And so I think it begins with awareness. And so for you to be here and to say, gosh, I want to do something. What do I do? We have time probably for just one more quick question. So anyone who has a short question. <laughs> the woman in the back. Hi. Um, Ian, thank you very much for your incredible bravery um, for doing this. I just wanted to say that um, we, we've been following you, um, everything on, online and we know that you did an interview at BBC. Um, and I, two questions really. Um, one, can you really try and push the BBC to show it on TV? Because I've been speaking to many friends and family about um, what your, what's going on in Fukushima and they're saying, why isn't it being reported on the BBC? That, you know, as, when it gets reported on the BBC, then the world will start to take notice. Um, and the other thing is, is that in the meantime, can we not buy copies of the CD, that we DVD, that we can then send to people that might be able to help forward the cause? Okay, um, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I've been interviewed a couple of times by the BBC. Um, unfortunately, it was specifically about the, the leaks, these leaks that were happening about a month ago. And they called me on the phone and said, you know, can you talk about the, the leaks? Well, you know, I'm not, that's not my area. And so they brought me on these, it's been a few times I've been brought on these shows, and they're asking me about the, the, the radioactive leaks, and I, and I keep telling them, you know, I'm, I'm working with these mothers, and so I can tell you 
um, what the mothers think about the leaks and how that's affecting the way they buy food, the, you know, how they consume water, the fears that they have for their children. But my focus is really on that. And so it's unfortunate that, um, that I haven't been given the airtime on BBC to talk specifically about what I know about, which is these mothers and what's happening with their children. I am trying, and I am trying to get um, a distributor in the UK who's going to help me to be able to do that, um, to put the film on, on, on television. Um, uh, what was the second part of your question? Oh, Person, th yeah. There's okay. There's a. I have. I have an online link which I can send to people um, that are that want to use it for community activities or um, for, for for journalists or to get it screened in um, film festivals. And for me, it's really frustrating because I also want the film to be available right now. I want the film. I can just put it on YouTube if you know if I. But I, I've been advised not to do that because the only way to get people to pay attention to it is to do things like this. And then once we get it recognized here, then, then we're going to you know, make it avail available for people. And so my, my goal isn't to sell DVDs, but I also want it to be available. And I'm really struggling with how to, how to do this. And I, and I, I don't know, I don't know what to do. It is on YouTube. Pardon me? It is on YouTube. The, this, this film? The film is not on YouTube. The trailer is, yes, of course, yeah. The trailer is on YouTube, yeah. The, the film in, in its entirety, we, we can't put it on YouTube right now because we would be disqualified from being in, in film festivals. Um, and, and, not, and again, not that I care about, not that I even care about being in film festivals, but that's kind of, it's unfortunate that that's the world that we live in. And, and so uh, the answer to your question is I want, I'm I want to make it available to as many people as possible, as soon as possible, and, I, and I'm working um, towards doing that. So thank you very much. Um, and I, so I just want to say, uh, now, uh, again, thank you so much for coming. And anybody who feels uh, feels moved to, please meet me in the lobby and, um, and, 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 and let me allow me to please record your message. And if you don't have time right now, I'm going to be um, here at the festival until Sunday. So please, please find me. And I'd be really honored to, to, to film that. And also, who's here with, uh, with the group in London that's going to be, OK. Um, so these, if you see these, these women here. Uh, after, if anybody's interested, kind of in, in thinking about, you know, what can I do, uh, you know, after the festival's over, how can we w get together? What can we do? Please see them, and um, you know, they'll talk uh, talk to you about kind of making this kind of grassroots um, uh, group. Just really quickly, because I, I know this is a story that you guys are going to really like, and just give me like two more minutes. Um, these mothers, uh, most of them, never used internet before. The amount, the number, the percentage of people that have internet in Fukushima is much lower than in in Tokyo, and. Because of this nuclear meltdown, they started to use internet for the first time in their lives. And they didn't believe the information they were being told by the government. And so they learned how to use Twitter, they learned how to use Facebook and social media. And right before my eyes, there was this grassroots group that was forming. And it was the most amazing thing that I witnessed. And so I just really have hope for the future that, these, that they can take this information into their own hands. They have control over how they're going to exchange information. And, and they are going to move forward, and 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 they're asking for your help, but they but they are also helping themselves. And so I just really wanted to share with you that story. So thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Ian will be outside filming, and he can probably take some more questions as well if you didn't get the chance to ask them.